<clears throat> Michael read you a scripture today from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 31 and 32. And it mentioned a bunch of uh, people in there. Rahab the harlot and uh, Gideon and Barak and Samson. None of them people was much count. I mean, Samson had long hair. <laughs> Gideon, he was, he was scared to do anything. I mean, he finally did, but I mean, Rahab. <laughs> well, that's quite a list of people there. And then it says uh, Jephthah. But then it says David. Y'all know King David. He was perfect. King David was perfect, wasn't he? All them bad people. And then right there amongst all them bad people, it says, and Samuel. Now, good Samuel. They just ruined his whole reputation, did they not? I mean, poor little old Samuel. Since the time he was a baby, his mama took him to the temple and he lived in the temple and he was one of the greatest prophets of Israel. I mean, he was a good one. And they stuck him there with all those people. I would like to have my name listed in Hebrews chapter 11. Amen. Maybe someday, well, not maybe, one day when we get to heaven, God's going to have a book with our names written in it. Amen. Right? Amen. I was going to talk to you today uh, from the book of Judges. And back before the Israelites had kings, they had judges. And I want you to turn with me this morning to the book of Judges. And... Uh, I want to go to Judges chapter 11. And I'm going to read out today. We're going to talk about one of those guys that was listed there that we read about. And it's Jephthah. Jephthah. Now it says here in Hebrew, in Judges, I'm sorry, in Judges chapter 11, beginning verse 1. It says, Now Jephthah... The Gilead was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son, and he was the son of a harlot. You would expect it to say, but. He was a mighty man of valor, but. But it doesn't. It says, he was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot. Jephthah, a mighty man of valor, son of a harlot. Now here in verse 2, it says, And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up. And they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of of a strange woman. Now it's interesting, as you read through this, especially the rest of the chapter, he comes from a place called Gilead. And as you're reading there, at the first one it says, And now Jephthah the Gilead was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead begot Jephthah. Theologians think that that's not even his father's name, Gilead. It's the town. This guy was so, you know, I mean, they were, we don't even know who his mother or his father is. It's like, Deckard begot Ron. And his mother was a harlot. You get that? I mean, that's pretty, that's bad, right? And, and, and so... 
Of course, I'd be sort of proud, Deckard. But, you know, she had these other, other children. And his wife's sons grew up. She buried had his sons and had other sons, and, and they grew up. And they kicked Jephthah out because they said, Man, you're not a rightful heir. Your mother is not our mother. We don't have the same mother. And so you got to go. We don't want you around here. You got to go. And so that's what they told Jephthah. And so he left, it says. The Bible says that he, he left. He got kicked out from his own family. From, he didn't had no inheritance. Betrayed by his brothers. Have you ever been cast out of a group or, or pushed out of a group or felt bad because you weren't like them? Or maybe you weren't as good as them? Or maybe you weren't as rich as them? Makes you feel good, don't it? And so they run poor old Jephthah off, cast him out. And the Bible says in verse 3, it says, And then Jephthah fled from his brethren, and he dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah. My Bible has that beside that. It has, a, it has translation of worthless. There were gathered with him worthless men. And they went out with him, and it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. So he was kicked out. And he collected all kinds of rejects, if you will. Worthless men, it says. Collected them all together, and they became a, a, a gang, a gang of worthless people. Now, I like that. A whole group of rejects. They all come together and they form this, this group, right? And they were, they were mercenaries, if you will. And they went out and they were men of, of hire. And he was a mighty man of valor, it said. And he had his own small little army there. And uh, he became great and successful, made a name for themselves. And so the Ammonites made war against Israel. And then this is where, this is where it starts to get good here, verse 5. And it says, And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, that the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said unto Jephthah, Come, and be our captain, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. <laughs> you see that? They said they kicked him out. They said, man, you don't have none of our inheritance. You got to go. You're not as good as we are. You got to get out of here. We don't want you. And this is what Jephthah says, verse 7. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, did not you hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are you coming to me now when you are in distress? That's good. That's, that's, uh, that's good, isn't it? Somebody there got the last, the, last, uh, the last blow, didn't they? So they come to Jephthah and they said, Man, the Ammonites, they're, they're after us and, 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 and will you come and, and protect us? And he says, What? Me? <laughs> what? I, I thought you, what? I, I thought I thought you hated me. <laughs> I like that. Sometimes there's people in the Bible, you know, they have a little a little bit of a little bit of spunk to them. There, Elijah was Elijah was like that, you know, on Mount Carmel. And so he says, "I, I thought you hated me. You kicked me out. What, what's 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 the deal?" And you know, they didn't even have an answer for him. They really didn't even have an answer. It says there in verse 8, it says, And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore, turn again to thee now. Therefore, we turn again to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. They said, well, he says, I thought you hated me. What's, what's, what's going on now? How come you like me? Why don't you change your mind now? And they said, well, just... We want you to just, just come, just, I thought you'd run me off. Just, yeah, um, could you just come and help us, man? Could you just, just come and help us? 
And I could hear it on the way back to, to Gilead. Oh, could you say it again? You, you need me? You need me? One more time. I mean, you, and so he says here in verse 9, it says, And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again, man, this is where it gets good now. He says, If you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivers them before me, shall I be your head? <laughs> Basically, if I go and I hope these guys, I want to be your king. I want to be your mayor. I want to be your president. And they said, verse 10, And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us, if we do not so accordingly to your words. <laughs> the guy that got kicked out is in line now to be the king. He was from the bottom. Be careful that the toes, what did it say? Be careful that the, 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 the toes that you step on today aren't attached to the person that you have to uh, kiss tomorrow, right? And so there they are. And so Jephthah, sure enough, he gets his men together and he gets ready to, to go out to this, this battle. And so they make him judge over, over all of Israel. And the first thing that he does, he's, he's not, you know, he's not, you get this ideal that Jephthah's just this worthless piece of trash and he's just, he's just an unskilled and an uncouth person and all this. You sort of get this as you're reading into it. But when Jephthah starts going to work, it sort, it sort of changes your mind. Because first, first thing that he does is he, he sends messages to the Ammonites. And what he does is he says, hey, what are you, what are you doing? And they said, we're, we're going to war with you guys because you took all of our land. And Jephthah, there's about, I don't know, 15 verses there where Jephthah tells them the history of Israel and coming through the land. And how they ended up with the land. And how God gave them the land. And what they did. And he explains all this to them. And he says, so really, it's our land by right. It was given to us and it's our land by right. And he explains all that to them. And another thing that he says is, he says, we've been here for 300 years and you ain't said nothing. How come now all of a sudden you're trying to make something out of it? Okay? And so he comes to them really in a peaceful manner. Now, what you got to catch here is in order to know all that history, see, he's got to know Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. He's got to know all that history, see. Catch this. Jephthah, he's tuned up. He knows his Bible. He knows, he's been he knows what's going on. He knows his history. And he comes to him, first of all, peacefully. He says, man, this is the truth. I know you think we got your land and you're coming here and you're coming back, but let me give you the truth. And the truth of the matter is this, and this is the way it happens, and that's why it's really our land. So why don't y'all just chill out? Nonetheless, in verse 28, it says, How be it, the king of the children of Amorah hearkened not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. He wouldn't have it. Regardless, even though Jephthah told him the truth, he wouldn't have it any other way. And some people, you know, they don't want to listen. They just want to fight and argue. That's what they don't want to listen. They don't want, they don't want to listen. They don't want to hear the truth. You tell people the truth and they really don't want to hear it. And I've been praying this prayer a long time. I've been, well, I say a long time. I've been praying this prayer for a long time. I've been praying this prayer for about a month. Right? I've been praying this prayer for about a month. And this prayer that I've been praying for about a month, I'm already ready to give up. Now you think about that. I just now said it out loud and it sounds ridiculous. I've been praying a prayer for a month. And it, God still hadn't answered this prayer. And I'm about ready to just give up. Because I'm just a, a month. That's, that's, then this prayer that I've been praying is, Lord, would you please send me somebody? At least one person. I know there is somebody around here. And, and I, at least one I know that is around here that wants to study the Bible and wants to hear the truth and will accept it. And, and Because, you know, all I get, you know, I only get, you know, I get people, I get all, all I get is people that want to argue. They just want to argue, Brother Quentin. Would you, uh, would, you, would you tell me about, uh, about uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 17, please? Would you, would you explain that to me? 
Oh, well, okay, well, it's such and such. Oh, what about this? Well, it's, well, what about this? Well, who are, well, I'm really the minister of the Baptist church down the street. You know, I said, I'm, I'm tired of that. I want somebody who genuinely wants to know and wants to hear the truth and they're genuinely would accept it and they're, they're determined and they'll come to church and they'll hear and they'll study and they'll listen. Somebody who's determined to, to, do the, to, to get to do it and is serious about it, honest. That's what I've been praying for. You know, because there's so many, there's so many people that they really just want to argue. They don't really want to. They just want to argue. And so this king, that's really, he just wanted to go to war. He didn't want to hear the truth. He didn't want to hear what was right. He didn't want to hear that really he shouldn't be coming there and having this war and there's no reason for it. It was a lost cause. And so Jephthah got his men together and he went to the Ammonites and he slew them and he whooped them. He whooped them all over the place and run them off. Then he came back home. And there's only one problem. It says here in verse 30. It says, Then Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If you will without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands. He says, Then it shall be that whatsoever comes forth of the doors of my house to meet me. Now notice he didn't say whosoever. He said whatsoever. He says, whatsoever comes forth of the doors of my house to meet me, then I, re I return in peace. When I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now he says, whatsoever comes out, I will offer it for a burnt offering. Are you with me? Do you think he had his daughter in mind? He didn't have his daughter in mind. And so, sure enough, he goes. He does those things. and He whoops those guys. And he does this. Now the Bible tells us, it says here in verse 32, it says, And so Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon and fought against them. And the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he smote them. Even till thou come to Mineth, even twenty cities, unto the plain of the vineyards, and great slaughter. And thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with trembles and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. Hmm. Wow, we've got a problem there. Now, I want to ask you a question. If he came home that evening and a frog was at his gate. Yeah. And a frog, a big bullfrog, a five-pound bull. Can frogs get that big? Probably five pounds? That big bull? Okay. Okay, okay. A, a big bullfrog was sitting at his gate. And he would have got that thing and he would have took it over to the temple and handed it to the priest for a sacrifice. What would they have told him? Cut a trail, dude. We don't sacrifice that kind of stuff here. Or what if it would have been a great big old snake? A big slimy, slithery snake? Or, or, or an alligator at the gate? A vulture? Maybe a wild boar at the gate. And he would tuck any of that stuff to the temple to offer it as a burnt offering. And what would they have said? No good, dude. You don't, it don't fly. Don't go. And so here comes his daughter. So you think he took her and offered her as a burnt offering? What if it had been one of his servants? Or somebody else. There's no way that they would have done that. They would have never threw him up on the altar and burn him up. And he said, whatever comes forth, I will offer it as a burnt offering. This was not what he had in mind. The daughter came to him. Now, there used to be 
an old, and when I say used to be, there is an old uh, George Jones song. And it's a song, I don't know what the name of the song is, but you guys probably will. That old song, it's about a Corvette. A guy that, a, a guy that comes to the, a, the store or something and he's driving a Corvette and his wife or girlfriend is inside. And he comes inside and the guy at the store says, man, that, that is, that, you know, he's, I don't know how the song goes, but he says, man, it sure is nice. I used to have one just like it, you know. And, and the man's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy says, man, I sure miss it, you know, and all this stuff. And he even says, the, I remember this part. He says, the guy at the bank took her away from me. And that guy's got to feel sad for him, you know. And he threw his keys on the counter. And he says, well, take it for a spin. And the guy behind the counter laughs at him. He says, I'm not talking about the Corvette. I'm talking about the girl inside, <laughs> right? Because the guy was thinking one thing, but the guy behind the counter was thinking a whole other thing. Jephthah was thinking one thing, but I'm telling you that God was thinking a whole other thing. How many of you, when we come to Jesus, when we come to the Lord, when we come to church, we've got all these ideals and, and all of these thinking about the way it's going to be and the way that God's going to use us. You know, i got, I got a whole plan laid out, exactly. A whole plan laid out, a, a, an itinerary that I can give to God and tell Him how to use me and what to do and when to do it and how it works and everything. Do y'all got that? You, can, you just tell you, you got it all worked out to tell God how to use you in, in your life, right? You, you know just how it needs to be. There's this little girl and these people were riding a train and they were on this train. They were going down the road, click, 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 click. And this little four-year-old girl, pretty as can be, a little dress and stuff, and she came walking back through there, and, and the guy, he was looking at her, and she was talking to him and stuff, and he was playing with a little girl like he used to do, and he asked her how old she was and what her name was and all that stuff. And she's as pretty as cute as she can be. And, and he says, uh, where are you going? And she says, I'm going to, going to go and visit my uncle. And, she's, and, and he says, well, where does your uncle live? And she says, I don't know. And he says, well, what is your uncle's address? And she says, I don't know. And he says, well, what state does your uncle live in? She says, I don't know. And he says, well, don't you think that you ought to know if you're going to your uncle's, at least where that's at, how are you going to find your way? And she smiled and she says, I don't have to know anything because my granny takes care of all that. <laughs> and that's the way God is. God's got your life planned out for you. He knows where you need to be. That's one of the things that you need to pray when you're praying is, God, man, I know I, put me where you want me and, and do with me. And whatever God's got planned for you is better than you can think of anyway. It's better than you can think of anyway. And so Jephthah, he comes home. And, and he's got this whole thing. You know, he's, here's what Jephthah's envisioning. He comes home, and this beautiful white lamb comes hopping up to the gate, right? And he throws it up on his shoulder and carries it off. That's what he's got in his mind. You know he does. You know he does. But he comes home, and his daughter comes out there singing, playing timbrels, celebrating. And oh, man. It just crushes his heart. It crushes his heart. Then it's the daughter. And it's interesting, as you read there, it says here in verse 37, Judges 11, chapter 37, it says, And she said unto her father, Let's, well, let's look at verse 36. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of your mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my death. I and my fellows. Is that what it says? It doesn't say bewail my death, does it? She's not worried about dying. She's worried about never getting married. Let me bewail my virginity, it says. And he said, go. And she went her way for two months. And, and she went with her companions. And they bewailed her virginity up on the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that he returned her, she returned her to her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no, no man. Why did it say? And she died. And she was offered up. 
and she burned up. But she knew no man. That the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament. Also, mine's got a translation there. It says praise. That the daughters of Israel went yearly to praise the daughter of, 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 of Jephthah, the Gileite, for days in a year. Four days in a year. Now, you know what I think happened there? I'm almost positive what happened there. You know, when we come to the book of Luke, and there, there's a lady in the temple, and she comes and she lifts up Jesus. She announces who it is. Her name is Anna, isn't it? And what's special about Anna? What does it say about Anna? It says that she stays in the temple and she lived in the temple and she never left the temple. That was the same woman. That was Jephthah's daughter. She was 800 years old. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but she lived in the temple. She was dedicated to the temple. What about Samuel? The same one that he's listed in the book of Hebrews with, that Jephthah's listed in the book of Hebrews with. Samuel's mother brought him to the temple when he was, she was little and she dedicated him to the temple. What did she say before he was born? She said, Lord, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to you all the days of his life. He took her to the temple and there she stayed like Anna all the days of her life serving the Lord. See, God's got different things planned for your life. God wants all of you. God wants your whole life. He wants us to be dedicated to Him. God wants everything. God wants it all. But you take Satan now and Satan, he just wants a piece. Isn't that easier? You only have to give Satan a little piece of you. That's all he'll say. If you just give him a little piece, he's happy. But God wants all of you. God wants everything. See, there's a problem there. If Satan's got a piece, God can't have all. Are you with me? When Storm was younger, and I used to ground him from, from, uh, from driving his truck, I would go outside and I would remove the, the coal wire and I'd put it up, right? And he wasn't sharp enough to figure that out. He'd go out there and try to start it and everything. It'd be a couple of days go by. He'd say, Dad, he said, you know, I tried to start my truck, you know, to keep the battery up. And I didn't know it wouldn't start. <laughs> it wouldn't run because I had a piece of it, right? As long as you can get a piece of something, you can get the whole thing. And Satan knows that. If you'll give him any little piece in your life, any little room, he'll use that little piece to stink up your whole life. I heard the story many times and told it much myself about the person in the faraway land who had a little, a little, little hut there. And he, he put it up for sale. He was a real shrewd businessman. There was this poor family and they were looking for a place to live. Had no place to stay. And so this guy, he, he said, hey, I'll give you a good price on that hut, right? He says, all I, he said, man, that's such a good price. That's a good deal. He said, why is it so cheap? He said, there's no, nothing behind it. He says, I just want that... The nail there over the door, just give me that where I can use that nail to hang stuff. And I said, well, that's simple enough. We can do that. And so they bought the hut and they moved in. And the strangest thing happened. They come out one day and there was a dead dog hanging up there. And they thought, wow, that's, that's bad. That's gruesome. That's awesome. We, we don't want that there. But anyway, it's his nail. It's his property. It's his nail. He can hang what he wants to on it. And so they let the dog hang in there. Well, two or three days, it started smelling really bad. So then they went and asked him, you know, to move it, you know. And he wouldn't move it. And the dog laid up there and it just got worse and worse and stunk worse and worse and worse so bad. It got so bad that they had to move out. They just move out and just leave it. Just get away from it. And that's the way Satan will do you. If you just give him a little piece in your life, if you'll put scripture down to watch a television program, he can get you. He can get you. If you'll put Scripture down to go do something else that you enjoy, He can get you. If you lay out of church so you can stay home and do something else, He can get you. If you have any little secret sin in your life that you just, just can't get rid of, I'm going to hang on to this little sin, but I'm going to do everything just right, Satan can get you. Because God wants all of you. God loves you. Satan just wants a piece of you. And if he can get it, he actually prefers you in pieces. Because he hates you. And so God got all. He got that all of us. She dedicated her whole life, and God wants us to dedicate our life to Him too. Now, you know, as you read the story of Jephthah, there's lessons, all kinds of lessons in there. And he was a lot like Jesus. He was cast out, you know. And his mother was this, this harlot, and, and because she was a harlot, that's, you know, that's the reason that he got, 
He got, he, got, he got cast out, and that's the whole reason of all of his trouble. And Jesus, you know, he had to, he, he was an outcast because of a woman, because of, you know, Eve. She ate the fruit in the garden, but not just that. Israel, the Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah that Israel played the harlot. And now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, the Bible tells us that, that the church pained to be delivered. And what they pained to be delivered was Jesus, the Messiah, the salvation to offer salvation to the world. The church was a harlot. And Jephthah, you know, he had this ability to, to not fight. And he tried not to. And he didn't have to. He didn't have to save them. Wouldn't it have been wonderful when they come to him and they said, would you help us? These Ammonites, they're fixing to take us over. Will you, will you help us? And Jephthah could have said, nope. You cast me out. You don't. I don't like. You don't like me. You didn't want me in there. No. You just go ahead. You're on your own. But he didn't. He didn't have to do it. But he did. He went to war for him, and he saved him. And he says, "If I go to war for you and I save you, what do you say? I want to be your king." And they committed to that. Jesus is no different. He didn't have to save the world. He didn't have to come down here and die and pay for it with his blood and buy it back and defeat Satan. He didn't have to do all that, but he did. And Satan, and, 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 and God says, Jesus says that, that if, if you want to accept that, if you want to accept that payment, then I want to be king of your life. I want to be king. And what's your answer to that? Yes. yes. Somebody said yes. Somebody said, yeah, there's somebody out there. <laughs> we want to make Jesus the king of our life. Amen. The one that the people rejected became the king. And in Mark chapter 12, verse 10, it tells us that the stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. Jesus, the one they rejected, became the king of earth. Jephthah, you know, he went around picking up worthless men. I want you to turn with me. Turn your Bibles to 2 Kings. And uh, 2 Kings, and I want to look at 2 Kings chapter 4. And Jephthah, he went around collecting these worthless men. And he took these worthless men, these different people, and he take them all and he put them all together and he made an army out of them. I like that. I like that. You know, that's the reason I love our little church. That's the reason, I, that's my favorite thing about our church is we're all, we're diverse. Did you guys know that? We are diverse. I love that, man. If we all came in here wearing black suits and white shirts and black ties and we all had the same hairstyle and we all acted the same way and we'd all been Adventist for 60 years. Man, that, I, wouldn't even, I don't even like that kind of stuff, you know? But we're all different, man. Really, we're all, in our own ways, we're all a bunch of misfits. And I like it. I wouldn't have it any other way, man. We're all that way. You can ask people, you can say, man, my preacher's got a ponytail, right? My preacher's, well, my preacher's bald. Well, my preacher's bald too, right? Right? He's bald with a ponytail. We're all misfits. We're all different, man. We're just, we are. That's what I love so much about our church. I would not have it any other way. We've got rebels and we've got nerds and we've got cool people. We've got all kinds of people in this church. And that's, man, I love it. We need more youth, even more than we have. But we're all awesome. We're all in our own way, man. And we come together and we click, man, like a machine. And we worship together and we, we hang out together. Who, where, where else, what kind of place could you get so many people from so many diverse different areas of life and walks of life? You know, we've got millionaires in the church and we've got broke people in the church and we've got middle class in the church and we're all here in this little group, man. And, and we, 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 we do it. We work. We're here. We're worshiping. We just done a diabetic class. We're growing. The Lord's blessing this place. And that's what Jephthah did. He went around and he got all these misfits. And they came together and they made a great army. And they did a great work. And I want you to read here in 2 Kings chapter 4. 
Beginning in verse 1. He says, Now there, now there cried a certain woman, and of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. So this lady died, her husband died. She had bills to pay, she couldn't pay it. And the creditor was coming to take her two sons and make slaves out of them. How would that make you feel? I'm coming to get your kids. Cynthia, you owe me $500. I'm coming to get your kids. That's pretty strong, isn't it? I mean, they got laws against stuff like that now, but man, wow. And so, it says, in your, and that was legal. That was legal, you know. I owe him $5,000. He's going to take my kid. And so she told Elijah this. In verse 2, it says, And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for you? Well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> uh, what about that? Well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> that sounds like a tough story. What shall I do for you? Tell me. What hast thou in your house? What do you got in your house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house. That's why they come in and take my kids, you crazy thing. She said, I don't have nothing in the house but a little jar of oil, a little pot of oil. So then he said, Go and borrow the vessels. Borrow vessels abroad. And of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, for borrow not a few. He says borrow a whole bunch of them. Right? And so she goes and gets all these vessels. Now this, this has always occurred to me. Okay? It may not you guys because I'm a little bit freaky. Everything's got to be the same. Everything's got to be row. I'm just like, I like that. Okay? But can you imagine? This has always popped in my head every time I read this story. She goes all over town borrowing containers from everybody. And he says, don't borrow a few, borrow, get as many as you can get. And she goes all over town borrowing all these containers. Now, without me going on for another 30 minutes, the, the, the oil is always a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And these containers, which are made of clay, you know, that, those containers, that's us. Okay? And God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. You see the illustration there? Okay. So he goes and gets all these containers. Now, I can go to Wanda's house and borrow a cup. And I can go uh, to, uh, to our house and get a cup. And I can go to Candace and get a cup out of her kitchen. And I can go to Cynthia and Peggy and I can get a cup out of their kitchen. And I can go to Kathy and get a cup out of her kitchen. Now, how many of you guys are even more so if I didn't ask for a cup? If I came to you and said, can I have some kind of container to pour some oil in? And I went to each one of these houses. That's just four or five of them. How many of you think that those containers would match? Well, I mean, from each one of you. When I got all five of them, do you think they would match? Margie. They would not match. They would not match. If I went to Peggy's and got... I mean, we all got different plates. We got different cups. We got different containers. We got everything. And when I went to all those places and got a container for each one of your house, they wouldn't match. I'd have tall ones, short ones, especially when I went all over town and got stuff from everybody that I could, stuff that they didn't really... You know, they're thinking, well, she's going to pour oil in it. Just, you know, give her, give her our dirty dishes. Give her our bad stuff. And it, so what I envision is in this house... They've got the whole floor covered and it's filled up with all of these vessels. And all of these vessels, they're all different. Some are tall, some are short, some are wide, some are skinny. All these different kinds of vessels that she's got. Cool Whip bowls and butter bowls and, and milk jugs, right? All this weird, all this stuff out there. Gas jugs, uh, a, a beer mug. We were walking through the... I want to tell you all this in case something ever bad happens. I, I want to be here until Jesus comes. But on my tombstone, I'm serious. On my tombstone, I want you all to write it in the biggest letters you can get on the back of it. Remember the Sabbath day 
to keep it holy. And the reason I want to do that is because that way I can witness after I'm dead. People come up ride the tombstone. They were, you know, it may even be during the Mark of the Beast. They'll come up and read that. Look at her. That dude there's trying to tell us something, right? Now, where was I? Y'all have got me off track now. Oh, we were in the, we were in the, we were, we were at the cemetery the other day. And I'm sure that, you know, this is, this is all good and everything. But I told a man, I said, man, I said, ooh, oh, ooh. Somebody had got a beer mug. And it looked like it had beer in it, but it, I, but it was yellow. It, they had got a beer mug, and they put that on the on the uh, tombstone, you know. And so I was thinking, wow, like, here's your cold beer. I was thinking, man, you know, I'd hate to take that to the grave with me. So that's why I got off on my, my little thing there. Beer mugs, but all kinds of dishes. I see all, you can have all kinds of things laid out there. None of them matched. Because... God is not, he doesn't, he is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care who you are or what you are or what you look like or if you're cool or if you're not or if you're big or tall or little or skinny or fat or dark or white. He doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't care if you're a welder or a construction worker or an office worker or a road crew worker. He doesn't, a sewage ditch digger, whatever you are, a hobo, God doesn't care. He wants everybody in his group and he gets you all together. He's going to pour that Holy Spirit on you if you'll let him. He's going to fill you up with it. And so that's what Jephthah did. That's the reason he's like Jesus. He got that army together of misfits. And Jesus has got, a, got an army together. You know, uh, onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. That's us. With the cross of Jesus going on before. That's us. You are somebody. We all, Jesus has got a spot for you, a place for you. We all together, it doesn't matter. We don't all have to fit one thing or one track or one way. God doesn't want that. God wants everybody to be different. He brings you all together because He's got a use for each one of you. He's got a crescent wrench and He's got a hammer and He's got a screwdriver and He's got a pair of pliers and a pair of wire cutters and He's got all these different tools that He can use. There are people that will not even look at me that some of you could tell them everything about Jesus. Me and John, we've been around a lot of places and different things. And I've told you all the story before about John. He used, to like, he used to like to get off in a crowd and get in an argument about the Bible. And he would get in a crowd of five or ten people and he would get in an argument about the Bible. And I'd even get a call. You know, it'd be, it'd be nine o'clock at night. I'm sitting at home eating popcorn. He called at nine o'clock and I, hey, hey, uh, I, I talked to these people about the Sabbath and, and they, they ganged up on me and everything and they said this and that, but here, I, you tell them. I got you on speakerphone. Go! Right? <laughs> he sort of calmed down on that now. But I remember one time, well, we, were, we went to this hospital. We went to a hospital. And it was the time back, a few years back, when I had the 18-inch beard. Some of you remember the 18-inch beard. And I loved that. But... I had the beard, and we went. He took me to a lady in the hospital. And he says, he says, I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know if I needed to, to, to give her a Bible lesson or what. I didn't know how to feel. He said, this is my pastor. And she said, she, you know, she was sick in the bed and everything. She says, he don't look like a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> he don't look like a pastor. But there are people that we can, but there are people who would see the beard and be like, hey man, that's my kind of dude, right? That's my kind of dude. That's how we are. I mean, there's just people that we can all reach depending on who we are and where we are and where we work and what we do. And God needs all those different kinds of people. And that's the reason I love it when we're all unique. I love it. God wants us that way. Jephthah put, on, put, put, his, put his life on the line for those that hated him. And he wasn't ashamed to call them his brothers and his family. And Jesus came down here and he put his whole life on the line and, and, and actually gave his life for the whole world, a world of full, filled full of people that hate him. Be Jesus is not ashamed to call his brother. You know, we always say that Jesus would have came and he would have done what he'd done if there was only one person that would have accepted salvation. If there would have only been one person in this whole world all throughout history, Jesus would have came and gave his life for that one person. Yes. But I'm here to tell you today 
that if no one was going to accept salvation, he would have came and did it anyway so the opportunity would be there. Yeah. Now I'm going to close up here, but I just want to tell you, there's always two women. This story, it starts with a woman and it ends with a woman. It started with a harlot and it ended with this virgin. It started with a woman and it ended with a woman. When we go through the Bible, we always, everything, all the, many of the stories and stuff, they've always got two women in there. Because we know that reading through the Bible that a woman is a symbol of God's church. Amen. When we read in the book of Mark chapter 5, it tells us of a story about a, a, a woman that had an issue of blood, had an issue of blood for a long time. And, and a man comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, will you heal my daughter? She's sick at home and she's dying. Little girl, 12 years old, I believe. Little girl at home dying. Will you come? And Jesus says, yes, I will come. I will come, come there and I will heal her. And on his way there, a woman touches him. And she's got an issue of blood for 12 years. And physicians and stuff had done all they could do to try to heal her. Nobody could heal her. She, she gave up everything she had trying to find a solution for it. And finally, she turned to Jesus. That's sad, but that's what most of us do. We spend our whole life trying to find happiness. And can't find happiness until we turn it over to Jesus. Amen. And so Jesus healed this woman, this blood, right? And then he went and he raised this little damsel, this, this, this little girl, and he brought her to life. And as we get a symbol there of the old church that had an issue of blood and the new church, the, the little girl, the virgin, that he raised up flesh. And we get these stories. Solomon had two harlots that came to him. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, we get a story of a woman that represents God's true church. In Revelation 17, we get a story of a woman that represents a corrupt church. There's always two. And in the book of 1 Kings, in chapter 3, we get the story of Solomon. And these two harlots come to King Solomon. And their problem is that they both had babies. They both had infants. They both had a son. And the problem is one of them rolled over on her son in the middle of the night and smothered him and killed him. And so she decided that while the other one was asleep, she would steal her baby and replace her baby over there with the dead baby. So she swapped babies and gave her the dead one and she took the live one. And so the next morning the mother woke up and she knew that that wasn't her baby. And she told that woman, she said, you got my baby. And she says, you're crazy. I ain't got your baby. That's your baby. Your baby's dead. And so you can imagine, you know, the, the Bible just sort of breezes over that story like they had a disagreement. I can, <laughs> I can imagine. And they take it before King Solomon. They said, what do we do? And they told her stories there. And she said, that's my baby. She swapped it around. Huh? It was a fight. Both mothers, it was an argument. Both mothers had a son. And both mothers claimed that the son was theirs. Okay, they were both claiming that the same son was theirs. But King Solomon, you know, he whoops out this sword. And he says, I'll take care of this. What we'll do, he says, I'll cut the baby in half. And I'll give her half and you half. And he probably whooped it out there. You know, he was the king. They could do anything. And he probably whooped that sword out there and was real serious about it. And no doubt, you know, they thought, man, you know, he's probably tired of listening to us anyway. You know? And so the true mother, you know, she, she called out, if you know the story. She called out and said, no, 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 that's okay. Just let her have it then. Just, just, just let, her, let her have it then. And the sword brought out which one was the true. Which one had the truth? Which one was true? And the sword does the same thing today. God's Word. Amen. It says it's sharper than any two-edged sword in the book of Hebrews. And then in the book of Revelation, it says it's got Jesus standing there walking in the temple. And it says that Jesus has a sword coming out of His mouth. Because Jesus says in John 6, 63, He says, These words that I speak unto you, these words are spirit, they are life. In the last days, way away from now, we're living in the last days. Amen. We're in the last days. And we're fixing to come before a king. And those of us that are living by the truth, that are telling the truth, that are saying the truth, we're going to be redeemed. We're going to be vindicated. 
And Jesus is going to take us home. It's our responsibility as misfits to form an army and gain the victory of Jesus and be ready when He comes to take us home. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn this morning. It's number 633. Number 633. And I believe that's when we all get to heaven. Number 633.